Last week, wow, that's loud. Last week, I was invited to play in a golf tournament at Cypress Lakes and Muscle Shoals. It was for the UNA Athletic Association, and uh, got to go over there and spend some time uh, with some guys that I did not know. And usually, when you play golf with a group of people that you don't know, someone always asks the question, "Well, what do you do for a living?" And uh, usually, when you tell the guys on the golf course that you're a preacher, the whole demeanor of the group changes whenever you're playing, uh, usually on their part. But this time, the guy asked, he said, well, what do you do for a living? And I told him that I was a preacher. And he said, well, listen, I've got a joke that you need to tell your church on Sunday. And I was thinking, oh, man, this is not good. I have no idea where this is going. So I listened. I said, all right. you know." And he said, now, listen, don't forget to tell your church on Sunday this joke. And I'm still, I'm thinking, man, I'm... Not sure if you keep saying it this much, I'm not sure I can tell. And then he proceeds to tell me about this preacher. And they always tell jokes about preachers, but anyway. So he tells me about this preacher that had been approached by the men of his congregation, and they said, we want you to start preaching without notes. We think that it looks more professional. We think that it makes uh, you pre- uh, study and prepare better. So we want you to start preaching without notes. And so he was real nervous about that task, and he wasn't sure that he would be able to do it. He wasn't confident in his ability. And so he thought about a way that he could give the appearance that he wasn't preaching with notes while still having some. And the idea that he came up with was that he was going to write a little cheat sheet and tape it on the inside of his jacket. And so that every now and then he would just adjust his suit jacket and he would catch a peek of where he was going to go next. And so he also thought, well, I'll preach an easy sermon. I'll preach a sermon about all the great men of the Bible. And he said, I'll just start at the beginning. And so he gets up that Sunday morning and he starts preaching about Adam. And he preaches for a few minutes or so about Adam. And then he transitions into Noah and he preaches for a few minutes about Noah. And as he gets around to that third guy, his mind starts to blank a little bit. And he's worried he's going to forget. And so he adjusts his coat and he looks down and he says, And the third person we're going to talk about this morning is Joseph A. Bank. His notes had fallen off of his jacket. And surely Joseph A. Bank's not the third great man. I thought it was pretty funny. I was, uh, that's pretty good. I'll tell that one. I'll tell that one. If you have your Bibles, join me in Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1. I, I, I have been looking forward for some time to the minor prophets. Those are the last 12 books of the Old Testament. The last 12 guys that prophesied, at least in our English Bibles, they're not in chronological order. In fact, Hosea is one of the earliest prophets that we have, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But I've been looking forward to these minor prophets Sometimes the minor prophets, they get overlooked. They get a bad rap for two reasons. Number one, because they're at the end of the Old Testament. And when you get down to books like Nahum and Obadiah and Micah and some of those other books, you really just don't hear about them a lot. You don't study them a lot. You don't really know about them. And so they have that strike against them, that they're at the end of the Old Testament. The second thing they have against them is that they're minor, and that's what we call them, that they're the minor prophets. And so somehow people draw this idea that though they're less in their message, that the content of what they're preaching and the stories involved therein are somehow less than maybe the message of Isaiah or Jeremiah or some of the other major prophets, but that's not it at all. In fact, what we're talking about when we say minor prophets is literally just their size, that they're significantly smaller than Isaiah or Jeremiah or some of the others. But these are incredible books filled with incredible stories. And one of the things, or three of the things, I think that really are seen in these 12 books, the minor prophets, from Hosea to the end of the Old Testament are our minor prophets. And there are three things that are highlighted in these books that I think are worth our attention. Not that they haven't been highlighted in the major prophets, because all of these have. In fact, we had lessons on all three of these so far. But these three things are incredibly evident in these minor prophets. For instance, when you think about the sovereignty of God, what you have to understand is that there is nothing that happens. And this is really important when we're talking about Hosea. There is nothing that happens in these books that catches God by surprise. There's nothing that happens. Even Hosea going to marry an adulterous woman like Gomer, it doesn't catch God by surprise. He knew it was going to happen. There is nothing in history that catches him by surprise, like the the locust plague in the book of Joel, or the destruction of Nineveh, or the invasion of Assyria and Babylon and some of the other minor prophets. God is never caught off guard. God knew about everything, and that's a comforting truth. 
when you transition into His holiness, particularly in the minor prophets, we've already established the fact that since God is holy, that means that He has to take sin seriously. And He does so. In Hosea, He's pronouncing judgment against the northern kingdom of Israel. In the books of Nahum and Jonah, He's pronouncing judgment against Nineveh, and so on and so forth. You see how God's holiness is put on display because where sin dwells, God can't. And where God dwells, sin can't. Those two things don't coexist. And so God's holiness demands that sin be eradicated. And then you see God's love on the pages of the Minor Prophets. Particularly since we're studying Hosea, you think about the vivid images of God's love that constantly leap off the pages. Jesus told the churches, the seven churches of Asia in Revelation 3 and verse 19, He said, those I love... I reprove and discipline. Jesus wanted the people that he loved to know that he does the things that he does to help them get back on the right track. And God's sending prophets, whether we're talking about the major prophets or the minor prophets, God's sending the prophets to them to pronounce this message of judgment and salvation was totally and completely an act of God's love, that he wanted them to change their ways. So in our time together this morning, what I would like to do is walk through Hosea chapter chapters 1 through 3. You could divide the sections or the book into two sections. In chapters 1 through 3, it's like an illustration, an image, a picture illustrated by Hosea and Gomer's marriage. Remember that Hosea is instructed actually by God to go marry an adulterous woman, which is bizarre, and we'll talk about it in a second, but that's what he's instructed to do, and so he does, and God uses their marriage in the first three chapters, or the lack thereof, to illustrate this relationship that he has with Israel, how Israel had been unfaithful to him. And then from chapter 4 onward, what you have is is Hosea's message, where he actually gets down to the heart of the matter and he starts preaching like some of those passages that have been read for us this morning about the judgment that was coming their way and the redemptive love of God that wanted to buy them back. But I believe that if you can get the first three chapters of the book of Hosea, then you'll get the book. And there's one overarching theme that I think dominates the whole book, and it's this, that God is begging His people to return to the redeeming love of God. Historically, we don't know a whole lot about Hosea. Chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us who his dad is and tells us when he prophesied. There are several kings mentioned. There are a bunch of kings from the southern kingdom of Judah, and there's one king from the northern kingdom of Israel. That's Jeroboam the second. You can read about him in 2 Kings 14. And so chronologically speaking, Hosea falls way early in this prophecy. When the kingdoms of Israel have been split into the northern and southern kingdoms, economically it was a really good time. Land was being expanded. Society was really good. I mean... Uh, commerce was strong. This, this was a really, really good time for Israel in that regard. But morally speaking, it was terrible. Moral, morals had declined. Uh, widows and children were being oppressed. Social injustice was rampant. And so you say that socially and economically they were doing incredible. But morally and spiritually, this was a desperate time. And so God challenges Hosea to, to marry this Gomer, this adulterous woman, in a way of showing Israel this relationship that he has with them. In in them seeing Hosea and Gomer's relationship and their life together, how that depicts God's relationship with Israel. And he uses that illustration. And it's strange, but interestingly enough, God uses prophets that way. I was trying to think of some other strange ways that God used the prophets. And I thought about in Isaiah 20 how Isaiah walked around naked for three years. Do y'all remember that when you read Isaiah? In Isaiah 20, Isaiah walked around naked for three years because it was like a a symbol of of the, the pain and the struggle that he's having over the judgment of the people that was coming. It was a symbol. And then I thought about Ezekiel who slept on his side. He slept on his side for two years, I think, because it was like a symbol of his mourning the upcoming destruction of his people. And so you have all these strange things these prophets were doing to teach a message. And here you have Hosea being challenged to marry this adulterous woman for the purpose of helping Israel see their unfaithfulness to God. In the midst of all that's going on, the, the social and economic prosperity of the northern kingdom of Israel and the moral decline, do you find a tough, challenging but I think vivid and very convicting story of Hosea, and I want us to walk through it this morning. There's four areas I want us to focus on 
First, I want us to see Hosea's marriage. That's chapter 1, beginning in verse number 2, right? Your, your Bible might even have a heading that says Hosea's marriage and children. So I think that it would be good for us to at least pay attention to Hosea's marriage to get an idea of what's going on. If we were to simply put or describe in a small way Hosea's marriage in a nutshell, what we would say is his marriage to Gomer was specifically intended to symbolize Israel's unfaithfulness to God. That's why he was instructed to marry her in the first place as a symbol, as a picture to show Israel's unfaithfulness to God. And the fact that you read in verse number 2, when the Lord spoke to Hosea, he told him to go and marry a woman of promiscuity and have children of promiscuity, for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. So God instructs him to marry this woman. And I'm thinking to myself, man, that is insane. That's crazy. That God would tell Hosea to go and do something like that. And it's quite obvious that she was this way before their marriage and she continued to do it during their marriage because in chapter 3, God says, go marry her again. So obviously she was doing it when he married her, but also he was doing, she was doing it the entirety of their marriage. I mean, if God knew that this was the kind of person that Gomer was, why would he tell Hosea to go and marry her? It seems like a crazy task, and it kind of goes back to those strange things I told you about Isaiah and Ezekiel and even some of the other prophets that did crazy things. But regardless of how bizarre and crazy that I feel like it might be that God says, hey, go marry Gomer, or how crazy you might think it is that God says, hey, Hosea, go marry Gomer, God was communicating a message through their story. And that message was simply this, Israel, you're being unfaithful to me. As you read on in the text, you notice that, uh, that, it, that Hosea and Gomer had children. Uh, beginning in verse number 4, you see the first one was named Jezreel and so on and so forth. They have these children. And, and basically what their children were to represent was God's judgment on Israel. Um, I, I want you to stop and think about some times in your life where you have read, maybe on Facebook, or you've heard someone say like a name of a child, and you're thinking, how? in the world did they arrive at the conclusion that that was a good name for their kids? You ever, you ever seen that or heard that? I think it was actually my mother-in-law that told me a story about two kids she knew that were called Arangelo and Lamangelo, and it was spelled like orange jello and lemon jello. You ever heard that? Yeah, somebody, two kids named Arangelo and Lamangelo, orange jello and lemon jello. And I've heard other names that were like that. And so I want you to stop and think, before we ever even move forward, you, you read in the text and you see a name like Jezreel, which some of your translations might have what those names actually mean. Jezreel means something simply like this. It means judgment is coming. Then you have the name in verse number 6, Lo Ruhama, which means no mercy, no love, or no compassion. And then you see the name Lo Am I in verse number 8, and it simply means not my people. And so you can imagine that, that they're calling their kids in, or maybe, maybe their kids go to high school. And it's like, man, starting at point guard tonight is not my people. Well, that's a terrible name. You know, it's like starting quarterback for the team. Judgment is coming. That's weird. Like you, you hear those names, and you're like, man, why would they do that? Well, Every time they called their names, God was reminding Hosea and Gomer and all the people who could hear just how serious of a situation this is. Jezreel, judgment is coming. Lo Ruhama, no mercy, no compassion. Lo am I, not my people anymore. You have forsaken me. Your identity is not me anymore. You've pledged yourself to something different. And so every time those children were named, God was communicating a message to Hosea and Gomer and to all the people of Israel to illustrate this very idea that Israel has been unfaithful to me. If you look closer at those names, specifically in verses 5 and 6, name him Jezreel. This is their first child. For in a little while I will bring the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. If you were an Israelite and you were listening to Hosea's message and he was telling you about this guy named Jezreel and he mentions the house of Jehu and the bloodshed, it would have brought up a lot of memories. There was a situation in which, well, I, I guess you could say it would be something like, you know, us saying the name Auschwitz or something like that. You think back to the Holocaust and how 
terrible that was and how it represents death and bloodshed and destruction. It's an awful image. And so him mentioning Jezreel would have been something like that. Like it, it brings up in their mind this vivid image of death and bloodshed because Jezreel was the place where Jehu, he slaughtered the whole house of Ahab, 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 10. But he did that because God told him to. God told him to go slaughter the house of Ahab. It was God's way of executing judgment on wicked people. And so what God is telling through the story of Hosea and Gomer and their first child Jezreel is, is hey, you think back to that situation in which God pronounced judgment on the house of Ahab. Israel, if you're not careful, that's coming for you. The second kid you see is Lo Ruhama, or in verses 6 and 7 you even see it alluded to, no compassion or no mercy on the house of Israel. I will certainly take them away. It's like God is saying, listen, I've reached the point where I'm past mercy. Like I, I don't have any more mercy to give anymore. This has come too far. I'm past that. The CSB that I'm reading says I will carry them away at the end of verse number 7. Rather, verse number 6, some of your Bibles might say, I will forgive them. I like the translation in the CSB about carrying them away because I think it really depicts what God was going to do, that he was literally going to carry them away because of their sins. And also I want you to see that the attitude he describes of Israel in verse 6 is the direct opposite of that of Judah, the southern kingdom, in verse 7. Listen, but I will have compassion on the house of Judah. I will deliver them by the Lord their God. And so what he's saying is, see, you don't know God anymore. You have forsaken me. Your identity is no longer with me. I have no mercy on you. But I'll have mercy on Judah, the southern kingdom, because they still know me as their God. And then you get to verses 8 and 9 and see that third child named Lo Am I. Or verse number 9, you are not my people. God says this is your new identity now, because you've pursued other gods, namely Baal. That was the main issue, Baal, but other idols too. You have pursued other gods. Verse 10, though, is huge in the passage. Yet the number of the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, which can't be measured or counted. And in the place where they were told, you are not my people, they'll be called sons of the living God. And the Judeans and the Israelites will be gathered together. They'll appoint themselves a single ruler and go up from the land for the day of Jezreel will be great. Chapter 2 and verse 1. Call your brothers my people and your sisters compassion. That word at the beginning of verse number 10, your Bible might say but or your Bible might say yet. Either way, it signifies this transition away from the fact that they at this point have judgment coming and that they have no compassion and they are not God's people. But God says, because of my great love for you, one day you will be called my people. You will be called people of mercy and people of love. And that reminds me of two places in the New Testament. You say, Ty, what does that have to do with us, right? Hosea chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, chapter 2 and verse 1. That's our testimony too. Romans 9, when Paul was talking about the Gentiles who were grafted into the way of Christ Jesus, who were not born Jew by nature, but they were grafted in because of their obedience to the gospel. Paul says of them that they were not God's people, but now they are God's people. That they had no mercy, but now they have mercy. In 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse number 10, where we read in verse 9 about being a royal priesthood and a chosen nation and a holy people for God's own possession, he says in verse number 10 that you once were not a people, but now you are a people. It's quoting from Hosea chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. That's our testimony too, that we were not a people, that judgment was coming, it is coming, and that we were not a people but now we are God's people. That we had no mercy, but now we have mercy. When you look at Hosea's marriage, it's communicating this message. Israel, you're unfaithful to God. They were reminded of it every day when Hosea called his own children by saying, Jezreel, lo Ruhama, lo Ami, or judgment is coming. No mercy, no mercy, no compassion. You're not my people. The picture was seen very clearly in their marriage. Israel was unfaithful to God. Number two, let's consider this area. The message. As you transition into chapter 2, you see Hosea start to open up as uh, directed by God. And now we transition away more specifically from their marriage and how it was established and how it started into more of a message, what God was trying to communicate. And if I had to summarize the message into one phrase, I would say something like this. Israel had forsaken God 
to pursue other lovers. That's illustrated in the fact that Hosea married himself to Gomer and she was unfaithful to him, that she was pursuing other lovers. And so there you have this illustration, this depiction of their relationship uh, or God's relationship uh, to Israel. The relationship of Hosea and Gomer and God's relationship to Israel starts to be spelled out a little more in chapter 2. Notice this in verse 2. Rebuke your mother... Rebuke her. Some translations, I think, say, plead with your mother. Plead with her. For she's not my wife, and I'm not her husband. Let her remove the promiscuous look from her face and the adultery from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her and expose her as she was on the day of her birth. I'll make her like a desert and parched land, and I will let her die of thirst. I'll have no compassion on her children because they're children of promiscuity. Yes, their mother is promiscuous. She conceived them and acted shamefully. For she thought, I will follow my lovers, the men who give me food and water and wool and flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, this is what I'll do. I'll block her. Way with thorns, I'll enclose her with a wall so that she can't find her path. She'll pursue her lovers, but she won't catch them. She'll look for them, but she won't find them. Then she'll think, I'll go back to my former husband, for it was better for me than it is now. You know, right there in verse number 2, there's like a desperation in the language. Some translations say, rebuke her. Other translations say, plead with her. Obviously, there was this desperate love or this desperate longing, a desire that Hosea had for his wife that he wanted her back. He, he knew what was going on and he knew what was happening and, and all of the pain that was involved in that situation, but it didn't nullify the love that he had for her. It didn't negate the strong feelings that he had for her. And so he was constantly begging for her back, but it's also quite obvious that their relationship had been severed, that, that she no longer belonged to Hosea because now he's having to plead for her back, his his uh, their, their relationship, I guess, or the divide in their relationship is described in vivid ways. And, and I think it also depicts uh, the strong way that Israel had completely turned their back on God. They had completely put a divide between themselves and God. If you look uh, further, I think we left off in about verse number 7. Uh, notice this in verse number 8. She does not recognize that it's I, or she does not know, God says, that it's I who gave her the grain, the new wine, the fresh oil, that I lavished silver and gold on her, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I'll take back my grain and my new wine in its season. I'll take away the wool, the linen, which were there to cover her nakedness. Now I'll expose her shame in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue her from my power. I'll put an end to all the celebrations. I'll devastate her vines and fig trees, verse 12. She thinks that these are her wages that her lovers have given her, but I'll turn them into a thicket. The wild animals will eat them. I'll punish her for the days of the bales to which she burned incense. She put on her rings and her jewelry and followed her lovers, but she forgot me. This is the Lord's declaration. If we could summarize verses 2 through 13 in three ways, I would do it like this. Number one, what the message is, is that she had loved other gods. But God desperately wanted to be her husband. That's Israel. It's depicted in how bad Hosea wanted to be Gomer's husband. He wanted her so bad, but she loved other gods. Verse 5. Verse 8, she had been lavished with all kinds of stuff. She had been given all kinds of great things, a good relationship, a good home, love, a good heart. Someone to listen to her and care for, all that stuff. And even the good stuff that helped her live, like her food and her drinks and all the clothes that that kept her warm at night. All of that good stuff, right? She had been given all of that. But she was confused because she thought that was coming from somewhere else when in reality it was right there at home. She was just missing it all along. She thought it was Baal that was giving her all this good stuff. But really it was God the whole time. In verse 13, God says, I'm going to punish her though. I'm going to punish her for her actions. There are things that she needs to be held accountable for, things that she's responsible for, and I'm going to punish her for her harlotry. Hosea's story in chapter 2, verses 2 through 13, shows the tragedy of loving other things more than loving the one who gives you all things. Sometimes that's a bad habit of ours, isn't it? 
that we love other things more than the one who gives us all things. And we have this twisted way of thinking that, man, all of those good things out there in the world that, man, we enjoy so much and it's what makes me happy. And we think that it's the world that's giving us all this when in reality it's just God. Don't let that overshadow the unfathomable mercy and love of God that's written on the pages of Hosea chapter 2. Here's the message. She loved other gods, but God desperately wanted to be her husband. And as a result of her unfaithfulness to him, there was a price to be paid. That's the message. But then transition into this third area in the book of Hosea, and that is mercy. We've sung about the redeeming love of God all morning. And and I don't want you to miss this on the pages of Hosea. Even though there are those messages like we read in Hosea 4 and in Hosea 6 about their destruction for their lack of knowledge and how there's this impending judgment coming in the form of the Assyrians taking them away. All of that stuff is coming. All of it's real. And all of that stuff is right there on the pages where God goes in detail about Israel's unfaithfulness to Him. But don't ever forget about the mercy on the pages that God desperately wants to draw unfaithful Israel back to Himself. Look at verse 14. Therefore, I'm going to persuade her. I'm going to woo her back, some translations say. I'm going to try to draw her to Myself. I'm going to do it into the wilderness or lead her in the wilderness and speak tenderly or gently to her. You say, why the wilderness? Well, it sort of brings back this image in the mind of the Israelites. That's where God established their relationship in the first place. That's where God made a covenant with them. That's where He gently and tenderly cared for them in the midst of a difficult situation where He provided for them every day new manna and bread and constantly showed them His providential care and satisfaction for their lives. God was doing that day by day and He wanted them to see that. In this you see the merciful nature of God on full display. Notice with me these three areas. Number one, when we're talking about mercy, you need to understand that God was drawing Israel back tenderly. And in the same way, he does the same thing for us. In the wilderness where God loved and cared for them so bad. You know, I read that in verse 14 about how God was wanting to pursue them and to persuade them to come back to him. And I sometimes think to myself like, why? Why? Why would God want to do that? It doesn't make sense. After all that she's done, After everything that's happened, why does God want her back? Why does God love Israel so much? After all of their sin and after all of their struggle and after all of their nastiness and filthiness, why does God want them back? He wanted so badly to start all over again with them. And sometimes I guess we develop this thought in our mind when it comes to our relationship with God that we're just too ugly. We're just too stained. We just have too much baggage. We just have too much filth. We just have too many struggles. And God would never, ever love us. God knew Gomer's reputation. And he knew Israel's reputation. And still, he wanted her back. Notice this, that God provides satisfaction and providential care for them. Safety, if you will. A couple of ways depict this. Notice verse 15. I'll give her vineyards back to her. Make the valley of Achor into a gateway of hope. You say the valley of Achor. He's referencing all of these things. Maybe you remember in Joshua chapter 7, there was the sin of Achan. And Achan caused the Israelites to suffer at the hands of God because Achan sinned and he didn't deal with his sin properly. And so the valley of Achor became a place where Israel was defeated and judged because of sin. So if you say the valley of Achor, the Israelites remember destruction and judgment and sin. It represents trouble. But now is coming a day where that valley is transformed into hope, God says, where mercy comes onto the scene and the place that you remember as trouble and destruction is sin will be converted into hope. But then you see this as you read on. He says in verse number 16, In that day, this is the Lord's declaration, you will call me husband and no longer Baal. Baal literally means master or owner. And so God was saying, your relationship toward me is going to be transformed from viewing me as your harsh master to the one that you want to serve because you love me. You're not going to view it as a task for serving me. You're going to serve me because you love me and you care for me. Not serving him because I have to mentality like I would my master but because I get to, like I would the one that I love. Third, verse 18, 
the result of that is peace, satisfaction, and safety. Verse 18, on that day I'll make a covenant for them. With the wild animals, the birds of the sky, the creatures on the ground, I will shatter bow, sword, weapons of war in the land, and will enable the people to rest securely. Notice what else he does in verses 19 through 23. He renews us by his mercy. Particularly, he renews the unfaithful in the text. I will take you to be my wife forever. Do you catch that? After all that she's done, I mean, after all that he's depicted about her unfaithfulness to Hosea and Israel's unfaithfulness to him, he says these words, I will take you again to be my wife forever. I'll take you to be my wife in righteousness, in justice, in love, in compassion. Verse 20, in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. God says, I'm willing to start all over with you. God says spiritual adulterers, they get their purity back when they come to me. They may have stained themselves with sin, but I want them back and I'll give them a new slate, the joy and the newness of life that we read like in Romans 6, 1 through 6. What I would like for you to do this morning before we transition into our fourth and final point is think deeply about your own sin. Maybe a sin that you're dealing with, a sin that you're struggling with, sin that maybe you can't get past in your mind. Think about how deeply that hurts you and how it impacts your spiritual walk with Christ and then think about verses 19 and 20 and how deeply God loves you and with that tender mercy, this deep, abounding, redeeming love that is begging you to come back to Him and be with Him again and start all over. When you know God is your loving husband, someone you love and get to serve, everything changes. When he's no longer the master that you have to serve, but the one that you love to serve. And then this, finally, perhaps the most important, area number four in the book of Hosea, Messiah. Where's Jesus in all of this? Where's Jesus in all this? In chapter three, five verses, the Lord said to me, this is to Hosea, go again and show love to a woman who's loved by another man. It's just I don't understand it. I can't fathom it. Just as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other God and love raisin cakes, God isn't saying you have to hate cake. He's just saying that those raisin cakes were offered to false gods. Don't, don't not eat cake at lunch today. Uh, verse 2, So I bought for her, I bought her, For 15 shekels of silver and five bushels of barley, I said to her, you're to live with me many days. Don't be promiscuous or belong to any other man, and I'll act the same way towards you. For the Israelites must live many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or household idols. Listen to verse 5. Afterward, the people of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come with all to the Lord, to His goodness in the last days. Verse 5 carries with it a messianic undertone. In other words, there's something bigger here than what the Israelites could just see on those pages. I know that because in some of the scripture readings that we've read this morning, in Hosea 4, in Hosea 6, and in Hosea 13, there were allusions in both of those places to the third day when hope would rise again or when one day Jesus would overcome the sting of death and the sting of victory, that Jesus is on the pages of the book of Hosea. Now before you get to verse 5, this is what he's saying in chapter 3. Hosea, go get your wife back. And you do whatever you have to do to get her back. Whatever it costs you, verse number two, you go get her back. No matter what she's done, you love her. God was going to use the exile, the captivity in verse four to cure all the problems that Gomer has. A period of trial and difficulty was going to fix her issues. But here's the real joy, verse five. Israel's hope lies in a king that comes through the throne of David. That God had a glorious future for Israel through the seed line of David. And you see the phrase right there, at the end of days or in the last days, verse number five, looks forward to a kingdom that would restore all the hope that had been lost. Look past Assyria. It looked past Babylon. It looks past Rome, all the way to the throne room of God. You look to Jesus who came to redeem his unfaithful bride. This morning we stand before God in some ways like Gomer, like unfaithful Israel. Wretched, 
wayward, dirty, even at times idolatrous. But Christ stands willing to draw us to Him, begging us to come home to the redeeming love of God. My challenge for you this morning is if you have been unfaithful to the Lord. It happens. It happens. Life has a way of convincing us to love the world more than we love God. Or by doing so, we're convinced that God is just like Baal. He's just another master that we have to serve. Let our vision of God be transformed by this story of Hosea and Gomer to see God as a loving husband that begs us to come home and be with Him in spite of all that we've done. That's the great God we serve and the redeeming love that begs you to come to Him this morning as we stand and as we sing.